Greetings, Zimbers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are brand new here or you've been sitting in the back row contemplating, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and then set your notification bell to all. That way you get reminded of every time I upload if you enjoy what you are hearing. Speaking of, if you enjoy what you are hearing, you can buy me a coffee or if you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel, all of that information can be found down in the description box. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Unsolved Mysteries, Volume 22. Right after this intro, an ad will play. Right before I read the first case, an ad will play. And there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. My heart goes out to each and every single individual who is missing. I hope and pray that either they can return home to their loved ones or their loved ones get some closure. Not a Sella, decades later, still no answer on mysterious murder of Italian woman. Who was Not a Sella? Since 1991, Not a Sella has been working as a secretary at the office of accountant Marco Sirocco on the second floor of the building via Marsala 14 and Schiavari, which is northwestern Italy. With the first name in vogue at the time because of the success of Italian singer Nada, the child grew up in a quiet and serene family. Her father Bruno was a carpenter, and her mother Silvana was a janitor. She also had an older sister, Daniela. Nada's life revolved around her job, family, and friends, a few close ones with whom, almost every week, she used to go dancing at a disco in Santano Stefano. She had enrolled in an English course to expand her skills, and she dreamed of traveling the world and exploring what it had to offer. Nada also liked going to the gym, listening to foreign music, and taking photographs. She also attended church regularly. Day of the Murder Here is the timeline of events to Nada's life on May 6, 1996, the day she was murdered. 6.20 a.m. Nada wakes up to accompany her mother to work. They leave the house a few minutes after 7 a.m. She then returns home, parks the car at the house, makes the beds, and sets the kitchen table for lunch. She goes out again, heading towards work on her bicycle. 7.30 a.m. She stops along the way to buy a focaccia. After paying, however, she forgets the food on the counter. The sales clerk calls her back. She apologizes and takes it. 7.45 a.m. Nada gets to her workplace. 7.51 a.m. Although she habitually arrives at the office shortly before 9 a.m., on May 6th, she turns on her computer at this time. The doorway below is open because the cleaners are finishing washing the stairs. A hypothetical murderer coming from outside would therefore not need to ring the intercom or have keys to the door. 8.50 a.m. Someone prints a two-page document using Nada's computer. 8.45 to 9 a.m. Three clients called Sirocco's office. It is Monday and perhaps there is some work urgency accumulated over the weekend. Nada, however, doesn't answer. A client who calls at around 9 a.m. claims to have spoken to a woman who tells them rudely they have the wrong number. So the client double-checks the number and redials it. The elderly woman's voice answers again and repeats to them that it is not the accountant's office. Later, the client will call a third time and Sirocco will answer, saying there has been an attack. 9 to 9.01 a.m. The downstairs neighbor hears banging coming from the apartment above. 9.05 a.m. Prompted by his mother, Sirocco goes to the office located two floors from his own. He lives in the same building, by the way. He finds Nada lying on the floor. 9.20 a.m. 
The medical personnel on the scene stated, As soon as we entered, we saw a girl laying supine, with her head facing the wall and her feet directly toward the desk, surrounded by a lake of blood. 10 a.m., Nada is taken to the operating room in such serious condition that the doctors have to ask for help from another surgeon. 11.30 a.m., Nada is taken to the intensive care unit and intubated. She is in a coma. 12.30 p.m., doctors ascertain that Nada is in serious condition and try to revive her, but are unsuccessful. 2.10 p.m., Nada dies. Investigation From the start, the investigation focused on Nada's work environment. It turned out from reading her diary that Nada was dissatisfied working for Sirocco. The job was monotonous and Nada was looking for another occupation. She had written in her diary, quote, I hate that jerk. I have to put up with him. I want to leave, but I don't know what to do with myself. Apparently, there was nothing else problematic in her life. It looked like she wanted to escape the closed environment of Shiabari and do something different. But in her diaries and her friend's testimony, there was no concrete clues about who would have killed her. The autopsy stated that there were injuries to her abdomen, thighs, and left iliac wing. No defensive wounds were found. The killer raged by kicking and punching Nada while she was helpless on the ground. Bending over her body, the murderer either then grabbed her by her hair and slammed her face multiple times on the floor, or they hit her with a blunt instrument. In any case, the blows she received resulted in a large hematoma and cranial injuries. These conclusions are supported by the projection of hematic traces on the wall and the hair stuck to it and smeared with blood. Almost nothing significant was recovered from the scene that would enable law enforcement to start the investigation, also because of some mistakes made by the emergency personnel on the scene, such as moving the desk to take Nada out of the room, and the police. No appropriate cordoning was arranged despite the possibility of curious observers polluting the crime scene. There were no bloody footprints and the murder weapon could not be found. The entrance to the office was not forced and no one took anything away. No object was missing, suggesting that the weapon had been introduced into the office from the outside and that the murder was possibly premeditated. Only a button with a five-pointed star a circle, and the inscription, Great Seal of the State of Oklahoma, 1907, was found. There were eyewitnesses outside of the building, however. A witness put on record the presence of a woman between 23 and 29 years old with wavy black hair disheveled above the shoulders, 170 centimeters tall, who held up her right hand visibly bloodstained on her palm, looking around continuously. Also, at 12.45 p.m. on May 6th, someone phoned the police, saying they saw a black moped fleeing from Via Marsala around 9 or 9.30 a.m. Besides Sirocco, another suspect watched closely by the investigators was Anna Lucia C. It is known that she was 27 years old at the time that she grew up in an orphanage, and that she had a romantic interest in Nada's boss, to the point of asking him to marry her. Anna Lucia C. owned a series of buttons that were similar to the Oklahoma one found near Nada's body. She also had a moped, but inexplicitly, it was not seized and analyzed by forensics at the time. The suspect moved to Lombardi shortly after Nada's murder and built a family there. Later, developments. Although there are several suspects in the aftermath of the murder, no one except Sirocco was officially investigated or brought to trial. But in 2005, the file was reopened, starting with Nada's diaries. In 2006, the Genoa Prosecutor's Office investigated two bricklayers involved in a prostitution racket for the crime. 
In 2011, yet another attempt to solve the case was made by three hairs that, it was later explained, did not belong to the victim. In 2021, thanks to criminologist Antonella Pesky Delfino, who presented a case analysis for her thesis, the investigation was reopened another time and lighted the presence of new potential incriminating elements involving a familiar suspect, Anna Lucia C. Here are the latest developments. Some phone calls have been circulated that prosecutors believe is C attempting to convince an ex-boyfriend that they were still together in 1996, possibly to ward off suspicions of her motive. In another phone call between the unidentified woman and Nada's mother, the former says, quote, But we talked to a few girls amongst us, though, and we said she, meaning C, has the audacity to kill Nada because when she says, I'm going to split her head in two. A beggar came forward and recalled seeing a woman in bloody clothes coming out of the Via Marsala building after 9 a.m., According to Nada's mother, a few weeks before the murder, the girl had received a bouquet at home with an anonymous note for an upcoming or possible dinner invitation. On that occasion, Nada had confided her suspicions that the gift came from the S's aunt. This would be compatible with C's motive. She knew that the secretary was a possible love rival. C. repeatedly made threatening phone calls to the criminologist who caused the case to be reopened. Quote, Why did you come here to make sure I only had one dog? I don't have only that one. I have another one that, if you come back here, he'll blow you up alive. Do you understand me? C.'s moped was recovered and analyzed by the forensic police with negative results. Finally, the most importantly... According to a geneticist appointed by the prosecutor's office, there are DNA traces on Nada's clothes that are compatible with the killer being a woman with a light complexion. On December 20th, 2023, the prosecutors formalized the changes against C, demanding that she be brought to trial along with Sirocco and his mother. The motive would be jealousy toward the young secretary of the accountant with whom the woman was in love. According to the police, Sirocco and his mother made false declarations about C and also apparently knew about her involvement. Sirocco changed his version three different times about the time he went down to the office, but it turned out. Instead, there is evidence of his access to the studio before nine, and consequently, according to the prosecutors, knowledge of the identity of the perpetrator of the attack. On March 1, 2024, Anna Lucia C. was cleared of charges and will not go to trial, as the circumstantial framework against her was deemed too weak and contradictory and unlikely to produce a conviction. Although the prosecution may now decide to appeal to the Court of Appeals, and if necessary, the Supreme Court. It is unlikely that C will be prosecuted again. Nearly three decades later, the murder of Nada Sela is still a mystery. There is no concrete motive, biological evidence is scarce, and witnesses seem unreliable. Sadly, the hope of getting an answer for Nada's mother, who continues to fight for the truth about her daughter's death, fades with time. Burger Chef Murders, still unsolved after four decades. A normal closing shift. It was the night of November 17, 1978, and 20-year-old assistant manager Jane Frint, along with her co-workers Mark Fleming, 16, Ruth Ellen Shelton, 17, and Daniel Davis, 16, expected to have another seemingly normal closing shift at the Burger Chef restaurant in Speedway, Indiana. It was the night of November 17, 1978, and 20-year-old assistant manager Jane Fright, along with her co-workers Mark Fleming, 16, 
Ruth Ellen Shelton, 17, and Daniel Davis, 16, expected to have another seemingly normal closing shift at the Burger Shift restaurant in Speedway, Indiana. Flemons had decided to cover for Brian Crane, another co-worker, that night. Towards the end of their shift at around 11.45 p.m., one of the workers was taken out of the One of the workers had taken out the garbage through the back. This would be the last known actions of the workers while they were alive. Kirk Thompson had planned to walk home with his friend Mark Flemons after his shift. At around midnight, Thompson would go to the burger shop only to find the restaurant empty, the back door still wide open, and cars in the parking lot. So he decided to walk home alone. Crane would also choose to stop by the restaurant, but to his surprise, none of his co-workers were in sight. Additionally, the cash register was left ajar, missing around $580. Worried about his co-workers, Crane would contact the police, yet his call would not be taken seriously. Believing that the kids were attempting to get out of work, the police raised no suspicions over their disappearance chalking up the missing money from the register to petty theft. Fried's white Chevrolet Vega would also be found the next day, a mile and a half away from the scene. But the restaurant was still not processed as a crime scene, and consequently, the burger chef would be cleaned and reopened the following day, with any potential evidence likely being destroyed. Quote, the Speedway police who responded to the call of the empty restaurant allowed employees to come in and clean the place. This destroyed forensic evidence. This destroyed any fingerprint evidence that may have been left. Kevin Greenlee, The Murder Sheet Podcast A Horrible Discovery Two days after their disappearance on November 19, 1978, a terrifying discovery would be made. In the rural woods near Center Grove High School in Johnson County, Indiana, their bodies would be found nearly 30 miles away. Three different manners of murder would claim the lives of the four Burger Chef employees, still in their uniforms when their bodies were discovered. Shelton and Davis had been shot execution style with a 38 caliber. Flemons died from blunt force trauma and asphyxiation, while Fried had been stabbed with a snapped four and a half inch blade found in her body during her autopsy. What exactly happened that night is unknown, but it is suspected that unknown individuals broke into the Burger Chef restaurant and kidnapped the four workers. Motives remain unclear as well, with theories ranging from a robbery gone awry to much darker contexts. Due to the early mishandlings of the situation by law enforcement, forensic evidence at the crime scene itself was lost, and so investigators believe that the true solution to this case would be found through detective work and not through the discovery of new forensic evidence. Recent News Recently, the Burger Chef location that was the site of employees' disappearance has been set for demolition. After it had turned into a Cashland pawn shop, which closed in 2016, even though the building may be moved, its impact on the community never will. I feel it has affected the entire community and will bring a little piece, but even that, you're always going to know that this is where it happened. That's never going away. Teresa Jeffries, sister of Ruth Ellen Shelton, about the demolition of the building. Additionally, in 2018, police released a photo of the four and a half inch knife blade found during Fritz autopsy in hopes of collecting information from it. However, as of writing this article, no known information has been released regarding anyone recognizing the blade. How you can help. You can help solve this case by sharing the stories of the deceased, along with helping identifying the knife used to murder Jane Fred. Any information can be given to the Indiana State Police 
specifically First Sergeant Bill Dalton, who has been assigned to the case. Eastbound Strangler, four women found dead in an Atlantic City ditch. Who was the Eastbound Strangler? Behind an old rundown motel in Atlantic City, New Jersey, four women, ages 20 to 42 years of age, were found murdered and lying in a row several hundred feet from each other, face down in a drainage ditch in November of 2006. The media dubbed the predator the Eastbound Strangler. The case has stumped investigators and has left the community in shock for almost two decades. Kim Raffo, 35, Barbara Breeder, 42, Tracy Roberts, 43, and Molly Ditz, 20, were all found murdered. Two women walking their dogs along a dirt access road behind the Golden Key Motel found the women at approximately 3 p.m. on that chilly November day. Each woman was lying on the ground in various states of decomposition, their heads all pointed east. They were all fully clothed but barefoot, their shoes taken by the killer. Autopsy reports. The autopsies would not be forthcoming due to the condition of the bodies. Having been left in a watery ditch, the remains had degraded. The cause of death would remain the killer's secret for at least two victims. However, the coroner did determine that Tracy Roberts had died due to asphyxia, and the most recent victim, Kim Raffo, had been strangled by a cord or rope. The cause of death could not be determined in the murders of Barbara Breeder and Molly Diltz, who had been left outside in the elements for up to six weeks. The toxicology report showed large amounts of cocaine in both Tracy and Kim's body. Molly's report indicated alcohol in her system, and Barbara had a lethal dose of heroin. This raised the theory that the killer may have been sedating his victims with drugs and alcohol. The young women came from very diverse backgrounds. Still, all were mothers and had experienced an upheaval of the death of a loved one or divorce and began using alcohol, drugs, and prostitution. Who was Kim Raffo? Kim Raffo, 35, had a good life. She was married to Hugh Oslander and had two children. She gave birth to a little girl in 1992 and a boy in 1994. Kim lived in Pembroke Pines, a suburb of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where she and her husband had bought a four-bedroom home in 1996, complete with a swing in the backyard for the children. Oslander worked as a carpenter while Kim dotted on her children and her sister's two children. Life was all about going to the park, carpools, PTA meetings, and the Girl Scout activities. Everyone in the family considered Kim to be the pillar of the family, but they all agreed that something had snapped in 2001. Kim had enrolled in a culinary arts course at the Sheridan Technical Center in Hollywood, Florida. It was there that she met Kenneth Belecki, whose own mother described him as a chronic drug addict. Raffo began having a drug-fueled affair with Belecki, which her family says made her life spiral out of control after being introduced to crack cocaine. At one point, Kim's husband angrily attacked Belecki with a baseball bat at a traffic light when he found out about the affair. Kim and her husband separated. Oslander sold the home and moved to Ocean City in New Jersey with the children. Kim was desperate to be near the children, so she and Belecki moved to Atlantic City. Oslander and Belecki got into another fight, and authorities took the children and placed them into foster care. Oslander then returned to Florida and tried to move forward with his life. Kim bounced around, sometimes holding steady jobs, but her drug habit became worse. 
She was sick and she needed help. Her friend Steve Cicero told NJ.com. It might have been a person who killed her, but it was the drugs that brought her to this. After her death, her family was disgusted with the numerous reports that Kim had been a streetwalker and a drug addict. She was so much more. Kim was a daughter, sister, mother, and all around a good person. She was the victim of a vicious predator who stole her away from those who loved her. Barbara Breeder Barbara Breedor, 42, was the third of the fourth victims that were identified from remains found behind the Golden Key Motel on Black Horse Pike in Egg Harbor Township. Barbara became addicted to drugs after taking a pain pill for menstrual cramps in 1988. The pills had been prescribed by Stanley Frizzle, her boyfriend, who was also addicted. When Frizzle's doctor stopped supplying the pills, the couple plunged into heroin use. Barbara's family thought she was destined for success, but her life deteriorated over the next eight years. In 2001, the couple's four-year-old daughter, Dominique, was sent to live in Florida with Barbara's sister, Valerie Anstey. Shortly thereafter, Barbara was working as a prostitute in the rough streets of Atlantic City. According to Uncovered, Barbara came from an affluent family in Huntingdon, Pennsylvania. She grew up with two sisters and a brother, and all attended Catholic school. Barbara was well-liked and popular in school. Everyone loved her big smile and quick wit. She had a broad intelligence and would astound her family by quickly answering questions on the show Jeopardy. She was well-educated and went to Penn State for two years. After college, Barbara began working for her mother, who opened the Santa Fe Trading Company, selling high-end Native American art and clothing. Barbara's dad died in the early 1980s, and her brother passed away in 2000. Her mother ended up selling the business and moved to Florida to retire. Barbara didn't want to leave the area and got a job at the Copacabana Casino Hotel on the boardwalk. She had met Frizzle there some years earlier. After Barbara's mother sold the business and left for Florida, Barbara dived deeper into heroin addiction. Frizzle and Barbara stayed together until 2002, when Frizzle was arrested for drug possession and theft. Frizzle was serving a year-long sentence at the Southern State Correctional Facility. He had heard from friends on the street that Barbara was prostituting and using crack cocaine. Two times, Barbara was convicted of soliciting an Atlantic City police officer and was sentenced to 30 days in jail. Shortly after her disappearance and murder, Barbara was living with her friend Richard Adams and his daughter Lori in a duplex where she traded chores for a free room. Barbara was last seen leaving the duplex on North Fayette on October 17, 2006. She was never seen alive again after that. Tracy Roberts On November 8, 2006, Tracy Ann Roberts, 43, called her mother, Joyce Roberts, from the Atlantic City Medical Center and asked to be picked up. She had been working as a sex worker to support her addiction to crack cocaine. Tracy had been beaten up by a John, and she told her mother she wanted to go back home to Delaware. Joyce immediately got in her car and made the 90-minute drive from Bear, Delaware to her daughter in Atlantic City. However, when she arrived, she found out she was five minutes too late. Tracy had checked out of the hospital and left with two unidentified men. We are good people who had a daughter who had a disease, Joyce told NJ.com in 2016. Joyce says her daughter had been a good girl who loved to roller skate and ride her bike and also hang out with her friends. Tracy was on the school volleyball team and had many friends who loved her. Joyce saw a change in Tracy at about age 14 when she started experimenting with alcohol and drugs. At 16, she dropped out of Christiana High School. 
She got a job at a telemarketing firm for a mortgage broker company and began dating a young man named Brian Rosello, who also worked there. The couple had a baby girl. After the birth of their daughter, Tracy enrolled at Harrison Career Institute to become a medical assistant. She also found employment with a doctor's office in Bear. Eventually, she bought a townhome in Pine Woods in 2002. Her mother says it was one of the happiest times of her life. Tracy loved her job and was shocked when the doctor moved, causing her to lose her job. Being unemployed, she couldn't keep up with her mortgage, and Rosello left with the baby. Records indicate the bank began foreclosing on her house only 11 months after she had moved in. Tracy had begun using cocaine. She moved to Atlantic City and was well known on the streets. Other prostitutes recall her as a very pretty, quiet, and generous. She would often share her drugs with the other women, who said that that was unheard of. She was very isolated, Denise Hill told NJ.com. Denise had been a prostitute for years and knew Tracy well. Denise added that Tracy seemed lovely. It was 12 days after Joyce made the drive to pick up her daughter when she found that four bodies had been found. She heard one of the young women had a butterfly tattoo and she braced for the news. The nightmare became reality when Joyce was notified about the identification of one of the bodies, which was her precious daughter, Tracy. With tears, Joyce said, Whatever happened, we love her. Molly Dilt Molly Jean Dilt 20, vanished from her boyfriend's Blackleck, Pennsylvania house in October of 2006. She had lived in a crumbling coal mining town with a population of only 1,438 people, located about 50 miles east of Pittsburgh. Her boyfriend, Jeremy Clausen, said he gave Molly $10 and asked her to wash the dishes while he was gone that day. When he returned, she was nowhere to be found. Molly was a plump high school dropout who was sweet but had problems, friends said. She had a 15-month infant son who she had abandoned, a warrant for drug possession, and she had no income. Still, nobody ever thought she would turn up six weeks later as one of the victims of a serial killer. Clausen said Molly would talk to anyone, but he couldn't picture her as a prostitute. However, she had become addicted to crack cocaine, which can make someone do anything to get the next high. Everyone knows each other in Blacklick, and others said her problems stemmed from losing her mother when she was about 15 years old. Then, Molly's aunt died the same week in an accident. If that were not enough, her stepbrother was also found dead due to a gunshot. Bernard Dilt, Molly's father, took her baby soon after birth and continues to raise him. The birth of Molly's son did not help her get her life in order. I want everyone to know Molly was a good woman and a good mother, Berner told the Pittsburgh Tribune Review. Molly attended Blairsville High School and is remembered as a loner. She attended special education classes when she was in attendance, but that was not often. After her mother's death, Molly's cousin Elizabeth Diltz said Molly began drinking and smoking heavily. In 2005, authorities arrested Molly for driving her car into a male acquaintance after a confrontation. She received numerous charges, including public intoxication and aggravated assault, but she agreed to go to a rehabilitation center. In March of 2006, Molly was arrested again for possession of drug paraphernalia, but this time she did not show up in court and an arrest warrant was issued. Sadly, Molly vanished later that year and no one was looking for her. The Killer STALK or STALK Incorporated are a team of profilers who aid law enforcement in the nabbing of serial killers. On their website, they provide a partial but in-depth profile of the Atlantic City serial killer, also known as the Eastbound Strangler. 
The profilers indicate the male killer might be a local man who is familiar with the Atlantic City area and the site where he disposed of the bodies. They say he is the very organized, rigid, and structured in everyday life. He more than likely read books about serial killers and knows about investigations and crime scenes. The killer has an extreme foot fetish and has a collection of women's shoes, including shoes of his victims. The man preys on prostitutes but has not killed everyone he has interacted with. He might say something about their feet or shoes when around women or female acquaintances, complimenting them. He may even offer foot massages. The killer also follows the investigation of the murders he committed in the media and more than likely has a history of sexual or physical abuse toward women. He was probably abused as a child and detached from his father. The profilers believe he has killed before and will more than likely kill again. The profilers say he suffers from a God complex, feeling superior and more intelligent than others. This may explain why he posed the women in subservient positions, with their heads pointed in the same direction. This has baffled the authorities from the beginning. In essence, the killer is extremely dangerous and does not feel guilty. He lacks heterosexual social skills, resulting in bad relations with women, and may have firm religious convictions that propel the rage he feels toward prostitutes. Either way, the madman is now the hunted. Authorities are always on his heels, waiting for him to stumble and expose himself. He knows the police are always close. While the Long Island serial killer, Rex Hoyerman, was drawn attention to this case, both investigating police departments have met with each other to compare timelines along with the modus operandi. They have concluded that there does not appear to be a connection between the Atlantic serial killer and the Gilgo Beach murders. Stock, or S-T-A-L-K, Incorporated has offered a $25,000 reward for information that leads to the arrest and persecution of the killer. If you have any questions about the Atlantic City serial murders, please contact the Atlantic County Persecutor's Office at 609-909-7800 or by email at public information at acpo dot org or as known as org David Harrington, Ricky Johnson, and Clayton McGinney, Kansas City Chiefs fans mysteriously die. Bizarre Deaths on January 17, 2024, five friends and Kansas City Chiefs fans gathered to celebrate their favorite team's win. Just two days later, three of those men, David Harrington, Ricky Johnson, and Clayton McGinney, would be found dead in their friend's backyard, the apparent victims of hypothermia. While the full toxology results and autopsy resorts have yet to be released, Preliminary results have revealed that fentanyl, THC, and cocaine were found in the men's systems. Law enforcement is adamant that this is not being investigated as a homicide case. However, the grieving friends and family of the deceased men believe that the tragic and untimely death of David, Ricky, and Clayton might not have been accidental. Who were they? David Harrington, 37, had been described by those closest to him as a kind, intelligent, and funny person. Lori Cruz, David's girlfriend of 17 years, had this to say about him. Quote, he was a sweet, sweet soul. He was mostly selfless, very generous with a touch of stubborn, but very determined. He's saved a few people's lives. He's pulled an elder and his dog out from a burning vehicle on the way to work. He stops and helps people on the road. He helped the homeless. He's helped me a billion times. And the list goes on. 
Lori went on to say that David loved God. He loved me, his family, his friends, and sport. He loved my children as his own. Ricky Johnson, 38, was a loving and dedicated father, as well as an avid sports fan. He loved spending time with his three daughters and would have done anything for them, said Ricky's mother, Norma Chester. Norma noted with sadness that her four-year-old granddaughter keeps saying, I miss my dad. Clayton McGinney, 36, was a devoted father and fiancé who enjoyed traveling, skateboarding, snowboarding, and motorcycles. Additionally, he was a subcontractor for a small construction company. Cousin Elaine McGinney said that Clayton was the hardest working man that he knew. Game Day On January 7th, David Harrington, Clayton McGinney, and Ricky Johnson went to the home of long-term friend Jordan Willis to celebrate the Kansas City Chiefs winning their last game of the regular season. Willis, a scientist and HIV researcher with the International AIDS Initiative, whose academic accomplishments included 55 published papers, lives in Kansas City, Missouri. A fifth man, Alex Weimer Lee, was also present at the party. The men were seen carrying two 30-packs of beer into the house. The gathering continued well into the evening. Alex reportedly left at midnight. At this point, everyone was still alive and enjoying Jeopardy. From there, we have only Willis's versions of events, but according to him, he fell asleep on the couch at approximately 12.30 a.m. David, Clayton, and Ricky were still there. Willis, who was wearing noise-canceling earbuds, claimed he slept deeply for the better part of two days, unaware of what was happening just outside his home. Willis didn't respond to any calls or texts during this time, and the family of the men were becoming concerned. Alarmed, April Mahoney, Clayton's fiancé, went looking for him. When she received no response from Willis, she broke into the home via the basement and came across a frozen body on the back porch. Horrified, April immediately notified the police. Increasingly, law enforcement had no trouble getting Willis's attention when they arrived. He quickly answered the door, wine glass in hand. I don't know why he would hear the police and not hear the people that had been there just prior. It's like he's acting. He's just trying to seem like, I didn't hear anything before this. And now that the police are here, oh, I suddenly hear everything that's going on, said Ricky's mother, Linda. Police quickly discovered additional lifeless bodies in the backyard. David was found sitting on a lawn chair on the back porch, while Ricky and Clayton were lying flat on the ground. It appeared that the men had succumbed to the frigid weather. The low temperature for the night on January 7th was 33 degrees Fahrenheit. But why were they out there and what kept them from seeking shelter inside? What happened? Willis professed ignorance as to what happened to the men, reiterating that he had been asleep the entire time. He also noted that it wasn't unusual at all for his friends to leave their vehicles on his street. Additionally, Willis's pit bulls, Daisy and Sadie, were at his parents' home, so he had no reason to go out into the cold. Kansas City police found no evidence of foul play and released a statement indicating that the case is 100% not being investigated as a homicide. However, some of the friends and family of the deceased fans don't agree with that approach. I don't know if Jordan gave them something like they're talking about. David wasn't a drug addict like they're talking about. David didn't do stuff like that, said Lori. David was murdered. Those three guys were murdered. Clayton's uncle, Jim McGinney, is of a similar opinion. Quote, I don't know about him, but these guys, the deceased, were not junkies. They weren't drug addicts with needle marks in their arms. They were professional people, and if they were doing cocaine recreationally, they never expected it to be laced with fentanyl and lethal. Conversely, Jordan Willis's attorney, John Perserno, had this to say, 
quote, he has nothing to hide. We went to the police station and spoke with the officers without a lawyer present. He allowed them to search his home. These were his friends. Jordan is unaware of how his friends died. Despite assertions that his client had been cooperative from the onset, recently released video footage recorded by one of Willis's neighbors tells a slightly different story. In it, Jordan Willis is seen wearing handcuffs while speaking to police moments after his friends were found dead. However, it's important to note that he hasn't been arrested or charged with anything. Some have been vocal in their criticism of law enforcement's handling of the case. I'm not saying there was or was not a crime, but if you immediately suspect no foul play, then you should have a story. You should have something to tell the families and for no one to hear anything. That doesn't make any sense, stated Ricky's brother, Jonathan Price. As a brother, I'm looking at everything. Jennifer Marquez, David's mother, is also dubious about Willis's version of events. Quote, My son and these other men were wonderful people. The story, the whole story, needs to come out. Clayton's cousin, Caleb, has alleged that Willis has a history of supplying his friends with drugs. The chemist, as they supposedly referred to him, is somebody that is known from high school as, like, creating drugs for people to make them feel better in certain situations. Clayton believes that his cousin was used as a guinea pig for testing Willis's drug concoctions. Other family members have reportedly told Inside Edition that they believe the men were poisoned. Recent Development a source close to Jordan Willis revealed that he has checked into rehab after moving out of his home. Willis, who is reportedly depressed and devastated by his friend's deaths, is facing his addiction head on. However, the exact nature of his addiction is still unclear. Following the sudden and shocking loss of his friends, he recognized that he had a problem, the source went on. We still have no evidence or indication of foul play. No one is in police custody, noted Officer Alana Gonzalez. On February 1st, preliminary toxology results for David Harrington, Clayton McGinney, and Ricky Johnson were made public, indicating that the men had a shocking three times the lethal amount of fentanyl in their systems, as well as cocaine and THC. Fentanyl is a narcotic. It's a short-acting, very potent narcotic. It's much more potent than morphine or heroin is, said Dr. Jeffrey Swisher, an anesthesiologist. While the case is still not being investigated as a homicide, the question remains, how did David, Clayton, and Ricky obtain the drugs? And how did they end up outside while Willis remained safely inside? Disclaimer, this next case involves a child in graphic detail. If you are sensitive to topics of the nature, a listener discretion warning is highly advised. Matthew Margolis, Savage Murder of a Young Boy Unsolved for Decades when 13-year-old Matthew Margolez failed to show up for dinner on the night of August 31, 1984, authorities in Greenwich, Connecticut, began a massive search in the Pemberwick Woods and by Ram River for the young boy. Despite having numerous suspects and ample evidence over the decades, police have not been able to make an arrest for a crime that turned a picturesque New England town into utter turmoil. Matthew was found dead five days after he went missing on a hillside near his home. It's a murder case that has haunted his community and baffled investigators. Who was Matthew Margolez? If you were ever out in the Pemberwick neighborhood of Greenwick, Connecticut, on a warm summer day back in the 1980s, you were bound to see Matthew Margolez. 
He was a regular at the Bay Ram River with a fishing pole in hand. He could also be seen riding his bike to his grandparents' home or standing outside the local deli. Matthew was in the 8th grade at Western Junior High School. Matthew was very close to his grandfather, George Miyazaga, who taught his grandson all about the outdoors while they spent time fishing along the Byram River. Matthew's mother, Mary Ann Margolez, described his grandfather as being her son's very best friend in the world. According to Dark Down East, Matthew's parents divorced in 1984 and his father left the home. The separation from his father drew Matthew and his grandparents closer. He lived with his mother and sister just a few blocks from his grandparents. Matthew always preferred being at his grandparents' home and often spent the night there. Matthew loved his time with his grandfather, and George adored his grandson. They would adventure together, locating the best trout fishing spots and finding edible berries. George would teach him outdoor survival skills, like walking on leaves and sticks without making noise. George and Matthew spent nearly every day together until the summer of 1984, when George was told he had an aggressive form of cancer, and he was unable to do the things he loved doing with Matthew. Eventually, George became homebound, and their days of fishing were over. Still, Matthew stayed by his grandfather's side, ensuring he took his medications and that George was okay when his grandmother Stella was at work a happy place in the face of tragedy. In August 1984, George succumbed to cancer, and his death shattered Matthew's world. However, Matthew could still be found on the Byram River waiting for a fish. Fishing was Matthew's happy place amidst the chaos in his personal life. It was a Labor Day weekend that year, and while most children left town with their families, Matthew planned to spend the weekend along the river fishing as he always did with George. He slept at his grandmother's home on Thursday, August 30th, and the following day. At sunrise, he was out the door to go fishing just like he used to do with his grandfather. What happened to Matthew? On August 31, 1984, Matthew dropped by the Spartan Deli to prepare for his fishing day. He bought a carton of milk and a pastry, then headed to a nearby bridge. About 30 minutes later, a woman asked Matthew how the fish were biting, and he responded by showing his string of fish and saying he was catching a lot. According to the Greenwick Times newspaper, Matthew then changed locations on the river and went along the east side of the river to Pemberwick Road. At approximately 11.30 a.m., Matthew headed back to his grandmother Stella's house. Stella arrived home around noon. Matthew was not there, but his wet corduroy pants were hanging on a chair, and his trout were in the sink. She left a note for him when she left to run errands that read, Get rid of the fish in the sink. Greenwick Times reports that Matthew was spotted all around Pemberwick. He had been seen walking down Morgan Avenue and later at Sparta Deli, a hangout for neighborhood teens. There was a group of older teens called the Valley Boys who had a reputation for malicious crimes and drugs. According to friends, Matthew began hanging around the group after his grandfather died. At 5 p.m., Matthew's mother, Mary Ann, pulled into the driveway of her mother, Stella's house. The house was empty. Stella had taken Matthew's sister, Stacy, to an appointment, so she waited there, thinking Matthew may have gone along. Still not home. When Stella returned home, Matthew was not with her. They waited for Matthew to come home for the next couple of hours. Matthew was a good kid, and normally... His mother didn't worry about him being a little late. However, as the hours passed, Mary Ann couldn't help but feel like something was terribly wrong. Mary Ann called the police to make a missing persons report. It didn't take long, and police were soon scouring the banks by the Byram River for a little boy 
they had seen fishing so many times before. Police search the area. Everyone felt Matthew was out by the river, so police concentrated their efforts there. Maybe he had fallen in the river and hurt himself. As darkness fell that night, they had to cut back the search until morning. Police brought in search dogs at approximately 11 a.m. the next day. Using the pairs of pants Matthew had left at his grandmother's house, the canines tracked Matthew's scent to a waterfall that was located below a dam on the river. Divers were deployed to that area of the river to ensure Matthew had not fallen in and drowned. Authorities also searched his grandmother's gravesite at St. Mary's Cemetery, along with an abandoned house on a farm. In addition to the extensive ground and water search with canines and divers, authorities also conducted an aerial search. Volunteers and police officers from the Greenwick Police Department, firefighters, and Westport Police Barracks dedicated days searching for Matthew. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, or of course FBI, also joined the efforts, but their involvement was short-lived because foul play had not been suspected. However, four days into the search, police cut back, citing that they would have to scale the search unless there were reliable sightings, a good lead, clothing, or signs that Matthew was in the area. Finding Matthew Police ended the six-day search on September 5, 1984, saying they were certain they had located Matthew's body on a wooded hill near a wooded ravine. A neighbor who had been helping track Matthew found a pair of black and white checkered sneakers at around 4 p.m. on that Wednesday and then called the police. Chief Thomas Keegan stated police officers located the body soon after the shoes were found and were treating the death as a homicide due to the location. According to Keegan, Matthew's mutilated body was found in a makeshift shallow grave and had been partially covered with leaves. According to autopsy records, Matthew fought off his attacker before being strangled and stabbed repeatedly. A spokesperson for the medical examiner's office said the boy died of traumatic asphyxiation and multiple stab wounds. He was stabbed 13 times and his clothing was used as gags and ligatures to suffocate him. Keegan stated there were numerous cuts on his arms, leading investigators to surmise that he had tried to fight back. Matula Velasquez ran the Spartan Deli. He was such a quiet kid to be stabbed, Velasquez told the Hartford Current newspaper. I can see some of the other troublemakers around here getting into more trouble, but not him. When Matthew was found, he wore a t-shirt and undershorts with his athletic shorts nearby. There was no evidence of sexual assault, but authorities said they were not ruling it out. This is Greenwick, man, said Jeff Tipke, an attendant who worked at a Glenville local gas station when interviewed by the Hartford Current. This stuff doesn't happen around here. I turned the lights on and locked the doors at 7 last night. Lots of people are keeping their kids real close to them today. What with school just opening? Investigation Authorities found a 10 and a half inch knife underneath Matthew's body and believed it was the murder weapon. However, the fishing pole Matthew had with him has never been located. Two weeks after Matthew went missing, a woman in a nearby apartment building told investigators that she had heard a young person screaming at around 6 p.m. on the day Matthew disappeared. In October 1984, the FBI conducted a psychological profile of the potential suspect. They said the killer may have been a local white male acquaintance who was knowledgeable of Matthew's love for fishing and the outdoors. Authorities do not believe it was a person from outside Greenwick or anyone who did not know the child. In October 2000, the New London newspaper reported on information that the suspect in the killing of Matthew may have been under the influence of drugs and taken multiple doses of mescaline that day. 
There were several teen suspects that displayed suspicious behavior around the time of the killing. Despite hundreds of leads over the years, investigators are no closer to solving the case. In fact, police have been accused of botching the investigation. Matthew's mother remains concerned that a killer walked free. Quote, My feeling is still that the perpetrator of the crime is from that area. I would say under 20. Peter Robbins, detective who investigated Matthew's case. Two suspects. According to a write-up by local Greenwick resident Tom Alessi on his Matthew Margolis website, the police investigation over the years focused on between three and five suspects, with other reports stating that the number could have been as high as eight. Of those suspects, two young people would be the most scrutinized. The first was a local bully who was known to cause trouble in the neighborhood. A former neighbor stated that the bully had threatened his own son with a knife similar to the one used in Matthew's death. He also had a history of brutal and sexualized attacks on other teens. It was learned that Matthew's body was found behind the bully's house, quite close to his property. It's theorized that Matthew could have been a victim of the bullying by this suspect and his gang of friends. The second suspect was a teenager with a criminal record who lived in nearby Port Chester. He had been seen covered in dirt the evening Matthew disappeared and also had dirt under his fingernails. He also had Matthew's fishing pole and knife. The suspect stated to a police officer that he knew Matthew and had fished with him. Investigators tried several times to question the teen and administer a polygraph with his father present, but he kept evading the meetings. Eventually, his father and his son would no longer cooperate, and the suspect joined the military, where he was dismissed for criminal behavior and ended up in a state penitentiary. A Mother's Nightmare Mary Ann talked to the press soon after her son's body was found and showed concern for other children in her community. She also asked for help to solve her son's murder case. Quote, I'm asking the children in particular. Kids, you tried hard to find Matthew. If one of you saw something, don't be afraid to come forward. Marianne told the AP, Think of the other kids that you can be helping. Despite the horrific nature of the crime, Mary Ann had told others that she refuses to become consumed by bitterness and rage. She would instead focus on the good that came from her precious son's life. Over 500 people attended Matthew's St. Paul's Roman Catholic Church funeral. Mary Ann recalled her son's love for the outdoors and thanked the police firefighters, and volunteers who spent five days looking for her son. A children's choir of Matthew's classmates sang during the funeral mass, sounding to some in audience like angels singing in heaven. Matthew was buried in a family plot at St. Mary's Cemetery in Greenwick. The little boy whom the townspeople loved seeing with his fishing pole may be gone, but the community has not forgotten him. Case files have yellowed in the decades after the senseless murder of Matthew. Police say they have resurrected the case numerous times and are still actively investigating. As of 2001, the reward for information has doubled to $60,000. Mary Ann says the investigation may bring some peace to her family if solved. For Stella and Mary Ann, it seems like yesterday that Matthew, with a smile on his face, was heading out the door to go fishing. His death has left an empty place in their hearts. The pain peaks annually at birthdays and holidays, Mary Ann told the New York Post. We will never know what he would have chosen to do with his life. I'm going to step out of the norm here before I close. Telling these cases that involve children absolutely rip my heart and soul out of my body. 
The reason I do this is because if this were my son or daughter, I would want everyone and anyone involved to search day in and day out until I find out and get some closure about what happened to my offspring. Some of the cases may be disturbing revolving around kids, but it is my personal opinion that the stories still need to be told. Who knows? That child might still be alive. I hope you can understand. With that being said, this brings a close to the True Unsolved Mysteries, Volume 22. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugar Spike, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita B., Nat Davies, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Stone Cold Wolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's Niece, Denise S., Coleman Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support of Back to Ashes, for without you, there would not be a channel or me. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed these cases. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.